A Lutheran View of the Validity of Lutheran Orders by Arthur Carl Buchorn. 1. Introduction A Lutheran clergyman is in general not likely to be disturbed by questions about the validity of his ordination or of the Eucharist that he confects by virtue of the power conferred in his ordination. He may have an intellectual awareness that not all Christian communities are prepared to regard Lutheran clergymen as authentic incumbents of the sacred ministry. He knows, intellectually, that his Pentecostal fellow Christians look upon Lutheran clergymen as false ministers of the gospel because of a defect of the Holy Spirit, in that they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and do not have as proof of that baptism the ability to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gives utterance. He knows, intellectually, that most of his Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic fellow Christians look upon Lutheran clergymen as false priests, as do some of his Protestant Episcopal fellow Christians, because of a defect of the Holy Spirit in that prelates in the historic succession of bishops have not laid hands on them. When your average Lutheran clergyman is made existentially aware of these convictions of his Pentecostal, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant Episcopal fellow Christians, he is likely to react, according to his temperament, with resentment or with amusement. But he does not lose sleep through nocturnal doubts that he may really not be an ordained minister of Christ's one holy Catholic and apostolic church after all. The very small number of Lutheran seminarians and clergymen who transfer their membership to the Pentecostal, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Protestant Episcopal churches for any reason, including doubts about their possession of the Holy Spirit in a manner and degree necessary to carry on a valid ministry, illustrates how little the depreciation of their ministry touches them. This paper is accordingly not a pièce justificative for the reassurance of uncertain Lutheran clergymen, but an effort at specifying the problem areas in a Roman Catholic slash Lutheran consideration of the issue. The validity of Lutheran orders and of Lutheran Eucharists could be defended in a variety of ways. 2. Possible arguments from the sacred scriptures. For instance, one could argue that the sacred scriptures nowhere specify who the president of the Eucharistic assembly and the person who pronounces the Eucharistic consecration is to be. There is nothing in the sacred scriptures that explicitly forbids setting up a roster of members of the local Eucharistic assembly and designating one after the other of them as the president of the assembly for each Lord's Day and designating others for other functions in connection with the celebration for a week at a time. One might also argue as far as explicit evidence in the sacred scriptures is concerned, that it would be wholly proper for one person to be chosen by the rest, at their pleasure, to serve as president of the Eucharistic Assembly for life, strictly as a matter of good order and convenience. In a Christian community, of course, this would probably take place soberly, advised in the fear of God, with prayer, and with some kind of ceremonial framework. But it would be a prudential solution based on a purely ecclesiastical human decision. One might conceivably argue, to suggest a third option, that there are hints in the sacred scriptures that certain persons have received a special pneumatic gift for this kind of service. In this case, the assembly's task is merely to discover and to recognize formally the inherent gift and the intention of the Holy Spirit and of the Lord of the Church in imparting it to the individuals concerned. One might also argue that it is in the nature of the divine economy of grace that every assembly, or intercommunicating complex of assemblies, of believers develops a form of ministry adequate to the group's sacramental awareness and conviction. If it believes that God wills the celebration of the sacrament of the altar in such a way that the communicants veritably receive the body and blood of Christ under the distribution of the sacramental species, its Eucharistic presidents will then have the requisite power to confect a Eucharist that realizes this conviction of the assembly. None of these proposals are particularly congenial to Lutherans who stand committed to the Lutheran symbolical books. 3. The Thesis of This Paper It is the thesis of this paper that, given the understanding of the nature of the Eucharistic sacrifice which this joint panel has reached and given the understanding of the nature of the sacred ministry, and specifically to the presbyterate, that Lumen Gentium 28 affirms, namely, quote, to preach the gospel, shepherd the faithful, and celebrate divine worship as true priests of the New Testament, end quote. The substantive matter at issue is the question of the minister of the sacrament of ordination. 
This paper is, in a sense, a sequel to the present writer's paper of September 1968, titled The Sacred Ministry and Holy Ordination in the Symbolical Books of the Lutheran Church. See page 101 to 119 above. The contents and bibliography of which it largely presupposes. The first part of the argument. 4. The form and matter of the sacramental sign. A Lutheran notes that for Roman Catholics, the valid dispensing of a sacrament requires that the minister of the sacrament accomplish the sacramental sign in the proper manner. Historically, Lutheran orders for the administration of ordination have, from the 16th century on, called for the laying of the hands of the ordinator and of his ordained assistant ordinators upon the candidate for ordination. They have also called for either a declarative or precative formula of words to indicate the impartation to the candidate of the Holy Spirit, and of the authority to proclaim the word of God responsibly, and to administer the sacraments according to our Lord's institution, to gather with all the grace and spiritual equipment that the discharge of these tasks might require. In the light of the history of the whole church, this formula must, in its context, be regarded as adequate. Finally, the Lutheran practice has been to combine in a single simultaneous and unitary sign the laying on of hands with pronouncement of the formula of ordination. On the matter of the sacrament of order, the Lutheran also observes that there have been differences in theological opinion in the Western Church at even the highest levels. The custom of symbolizing the office to which a person was being ordained by giving him appropriate instruments in the course of the rite is not documentable before about the 10th century. By the time of the Council of Ferrara Florence in 1439, the Bishop of Rome felt safe in the Decretum Pro Armenes in affirming that the Porectio or Traditio Instrumentorum was the sole matter of order, a position that was commonly affirmed by theologians subsequently. In 1947, however, Pius XII in Sacramentum Ordinis defined, but only for the future, the matter of order as the laying on of hands. The Lutheran also observes with interest that according to Sacramentum Ordinis, it is the gloved hand of the bishop that is involved in the matter of order by being laid upon the head of the ordinand, and that there is therefore no direct skin contact of episcopal palm with diaconate pate. The Lutheran is likewise reassured when he reads a Roman Catholic treatise that affirms quote, that the laying on of hands simply serves to designate the precise persons upon whom the blessing of ordination is being called down, and to express the will of the ordaining bishop that they should receive it, end quote. A Lutheran would observe that the formula of words that in scholastic language constitute the form of the sacrament is not a matter of divine revelation, and that the practice of the church has not been wholly consistent. This is true both of the total church and of the individual parts of the church, including the Patriarchate of the West, where the form of the sacrament of ordination has undergone a great many changes. A Lutheran feels that the formulas in use in the Lutheran community are at least as specific with reference to the nature and purpose of the action of ordination as the prayer of the church order ascribed to Hippolytus at the beginning of the 3rd century, or the 31 words that Pius XII specified as the form of ordination to the priesthood in Sacramentum Ordinis, Daque sumus omnipotens pater in hunc famulum tuum presbyteri dignitatim, enova in vestribus ejus spiritum sanctitatis ut acceptum a te, Deus, secundi mereti munus obtenet, censuramque morum exemplo suae conversationis insinuat. That is, Almighty Father, we ask you to give to this your servant the dignity of a presbyter. Renew within him the spirit of holiness, that he may retain the second rank office received from you, O God, and by the example of his own behavior may persuasively impart a moral standard. 5. The Minister of the Sacrament of Order Turning to the question of the minister of the sacrament of order, a Lutheran cannot find in the sacred scriptures evidence that bishops, in any sense that this term came to acquire the Protestant Church, were the only ordinators in the apostolic period. Certainly, he feels, this cannot be proved by the passages conventionally alleged, Acts 6.6 6 and 14.22, 1 Timothy 5.22, 2 Timothy 1.6, Titus 1.5. He observes further that the liturgical evidence of a later period is not decisive for establishing the principle that only bishops can ordain, 
we do not have any descriptions of or extensive allusions to the rite of ordination prior to the period in which the monarchical episcopate had triumphed. The tendency of liturgical theology is to derive its principles a posteriori from the liturgical data. From the fact that the bishop was in fact the ordinary ordinator, it was almost inevitable that he should be regarded as the sole proper minister of ordination. The matter of exceptions to this rule will be treated below. While Lutherans would find it impossible in the premise to describe the superiority of bishops over priests as de fide and jure divino, they have always been ready to concede the canonical and functional superiority of those who have the responsibility of oversight over many churches in relation to those who are canonically and functionally subordinated to them as pastors of parishes. The Lutherans stand committed to the desirability of the traditional episcopal polity by their symbolical books. Apology 14, 1.5 even where the title of bishop was not or has not been preserved, the function of oversight was and is acknowledged as necessary and in accord with the divine will, although the mode and the extent of such oversight varies according to the constitution of the given ecclesiastical unit. In those Lutheran communities that have preserved or recovered the historic episcopate, the competence to ordain belongs to the bishop alone. This is generally true of those Lutheran communities, likewise, that have retained or recovered an episcopal structure although they may not have an quote-unquote apostolic succession of bishops. It is likewise generally true of those Lutheran church bodies who do not have a formal episcopal structure, but whose size requires an office of oversight and administration under some name other than bishop, at least to the extent that a licit ordination requires the authorization of the appropriate administrative officer, synod president, district president, and so on. 6. The orthodoxy of belief and state of grace of the minister of order. A Lutheran notes that in Roman Catholic theology, the validity and efficacy of the sacrament of order is independent of the orthodoxy and state of the ordinator. With this principle, he would concur. 7. The intention of the minister of order. In light of standard Lutheran theological discussions of ordination, it may be presumed that ministers of ordination in the Lutheran community have had the intention at least of doing what the church does, even though this begins to become an explicit requirement in Western theological reflection only about the beginning of the 13th century. The Lutheran concedes, of course, that this opinion has a long implicit history behind it, and that we may see it as far back as the mid-3rd century, when, according to Eusebius, St. Cornelius, Bishop of Rome, asserted that the consecration of his rigorous rival Novation was a mere, quote, seeming and ineffective laying on of hands, end quote. 8. The Intention of the Ordinant It can be presumed, from the understanding that Lutherans have of the nature of the sacred ministry, that the candidates for ordination in the Lutheran Church have had the intention of receiving what the Church gives, and have thus met the minimum requirement in the way of intention that the certain opinion of Roman Catholic theologians has regarded as necessary. 9. The Orthodoxy of Belief and State of Grace of the Ordinant A Lutheran would note that it is a common opinion in the Roman Catholic Church that neither orthodox belief nor moral worthiness in the recipient is necessary for the valid reception of ordination. If a Lutheran candidate for ordination received it in a state of moral unworthiness, it can also be presumed that, according to the common Roman Catholic opinion, the requisite measure of sacramental grace was conferred through the revival of ordination when the moral indisposition was removed. 10. The Effect of Ordination In describing the effect of ordination, a Lutheran does not habitually talk about sanctifying grace and actual graces, although he affirms what he understands these terms as applying when a Roman Catholic theologian uses them, specifically in light of 1 Timothy 4.14 and 2 Timothy 2.6, a Lutheran would agree that ordination has as one of its purposes to enable the person ordained to proclaim the word of God responsibly, to administer the sacraments according to our Lord's institution, to lead a worthy life, and to possess those competences that his service as a clergyman requires in his case. 11. Ordination not to be repeated. Like the Roman Catholic, the Lutheran too sees ordination as conferring a spiritual authority on the recipient in a once-for-all fashion. 
namely, the power to sanctify through the proclamation and application of the word of God and the administration of these sacraments according to our Lord's institution, the power to teach, the power to absolve, the power to excommunicate public offenders, and the power to reconcile them to the church when they repent, and, as authorized, the power to ordain. At the same time, the Lutheran is not unaware of the historical problems presented in the Middle Ages by de facto reordinations, in cases of deposition, or in cases of ordinations administered by heretical, schismatic, or simoniacal prelates. A Lutheran does not normally talk about importation of an ineradicable mark, character in indelebilis. He regards this term as, at best, a metaphor based upon a non-biblical scholastic anthropology and psychology with which he is uncomfortable. If the purpose of the metaphor is to declare that a validly ordained person ought not to be reordained, the thrust of Lutheran conviction and practice is to affirm this. An ordained person who temporarily, or even with the intention of doing so permanently, renounces his tasks as an ordained clergyman is not again ordained when he resumes them. Admittedly, there is some uncertainty and inconsistency among Lutherans when a person ordained in another communion becomes a Lutheran clergyman. Since a commitment to the teaching of the Lutheran symbolical books has historically been and continues widely to be an important preliminary to ordination in the Lutheran Church, a clear distinction between this formal commitment to the Lutheran symbolical books and actual ordination has not always been made. If the candidate for the ministerium of the Lutheran Church has already been ordained as a minister of the Church of Christ, the tendency seems to be to require him merely to affirm his acceptance of the Lutheran symbolical books and then to install or institute him in his due ministry, but not formally to attempt to reordain him. The terminology signum configurativum, as conforming the ordained person to Christ as the preeminent worshiper of the Father, signum distinctivum, as distinguishing the ordained from the unordained person, and signum dispositivum, as enabling him to exercise the authority of the sacred ministry. In speaking of the ineradicable imprint is not natively Lutheran, but the Lutheran has no problem in integrating it into the reality that he sees the basic metaphor as designed to convey. 12. The Sacramentality of the Sacred Ministry and of Ordination Lutherans are not unwilling to describe as a sacrament both the sacred ministry itself and ordination through the laying on of hands. Apology 13, 9 through 13. Any difficulty that may exist lies in the conventional definition of the term sacrament. As a church word, rather than a Bible word, it admits of varying definitions. In the heightening polemical atmosphere of the later 16th and 17th centuries, both the Roman Catholic and Lutheran theological traditions almost deliberately committed themselves to mutually exclusive definitions of the term sacrament. In spite of this, the continuing willingness of the Lutheran community to attribute sacramentality to the sacred ministry and to ordination is a datum of its continuing commitment to the Lutheran symbolical books. The second part of the argument. 13. Statement of the historical issues involved. The historical issues revolve around two considerations. First, is the episcopate a divinely instituted order different from and intrinsically superior to the presbyterate? Or was the episcopate originally identical with the presbyterate, and was the former differentiated from the latter only by ecclesiastical, that is, for a Lutheran, human right? Second, are there instances of presbyteral ordinations to the presbyterate that the Roman Catholic Church regards as presumptively valid? 14. The synonymity of presbyter and bishop in the first five centuries. The biblical evidence alleged in favor of the original identity of the episcopate and the presbyterate has often been rehearsed. The reference to bishops and deacons, with no mention of presbyters in Philippians 1.1, the reference to the same officials of the Ephesian church as presbyters and bishops within the space of 12 verses in Acts 20, 17 through 28. The reference to the presbyters that Titus had instituted in Crete as bishops, Titus 1, 5 through 7. The listing of canonical qualifications for bishops and deacons, but not for presbyters in the pastorals. The designation of the authors of 2nd and 3rd John and of 1st Peter as presbyter and co-presbyter. 2 John 1, 3 John 1, 1 Peter 5, 1, and the reference to presbyters, but not to bishops in James. 
the situation is not much different in the period of the Apostolic Fathers. In First Clement, about 96, the leaders of the Christian communities are bishops and deacons, 42.4.5. Presbyter seems to be the synonym of bishop at least in 44.5, see verses 1 and 4, 47.6, 54.2, and 57.1. The community of the Didache, first half of the second century, also operates with bishops and deacons, 15.1. The presbyters are named as the ruling officers in the Shepherd of Aramas, about 150, Vision 2, 4, 2.3, see 2, 2, 6, 3, 7, 8, 3, 9, 7. Apostles, bishops, teachers, and deacons appear in 351. Bishops and Philokinoi, literally stranger lovers, appear in Similitude 9.27.2. There are presbyters and deacons at Smyrna and at Philippi according to the letter of St. Polycarp, 69-155, 5-3. The address and 6-1 speak only of presbyters. The reference to Valens the presbyter in 11-1 does not help us. St. Polycarp himself is called bishop only in the subsequently added titles of the letter and of the martyrdom. Presbyters are the ruling officers in 2 Clement 17.3, about 8150. Presbyter is the synonym of bishop in St. Irenaeus of Lyons, 130-200, against heresies 322, also see 332, and 426.5. In Eusebius, Church History 524, quoting St. Victor of Rome, died 198, and in St. Clement of Alexandria, 150-215, quis tuies salvator, 42. The letter of St. Firmilian of Carthage died 268, reproduced in St. Cyprian's correspondence as letter 75, 4.7, can also be cited. St. John Chrysostom recognizes the synonymity of presbyter and bishop in the New Testament in his homilies on Philippians, on 1.1. So does Theodoret 393-458, in his comments on Philippians 1.1 and 1 Timothy 3.1, as well as Egmanios, 6th century, on his commentary on the Acts of the Apostles, on 2017, and St. Maximus the Confessor, 580-662, in his Scolia on Concerning the Divine Names of Dionysius the Areopagite, 1-1. St. Jerome, 342-420, sets forth his position unambiguously in his letter 148-85 to Evangelus. Quote, The Apostle clearly teaches that presbyters are the same as bishops listen to another bit of evidence in which it is most clearly proved that the bishop and the presbyter are the same. But at a later date, the choice of one who was placed ahead of the others was undertaken as a remedy against schism, lest some one person, by attracting a following, would rend the Church of Christ. Thus, at Alexandria, from St. Mark the Evangelist down to the bishops, Saints Heraclius, died 247, and Dionysius, died 265, the presbyters always chose one of their own number whom they would place on a higher level and call bishop, just as if an army were to make an emperor, or deacons would choose out of their midst one whose diligence they knew and call him archdeacon. For apart from ordination, what does a bishop do that a presbyter does not do? End quote. In his commentary on Titus, on 1.5, he states, quote, The presbyter, accordingly, is the same as a bishop. And before rivalries came about in our religion through diabolical impulse, and they would say among the people, I am of Paul, I am of Apollo, I am of Savas, the churches were governed by a common council of presbyters. Later on, some individual believed that those whom he baptized were his, not Christ's, and it was decreed in the whole world that one of the presbyters should be chosen and placed over the rest and have the care of a single church and the seeds of divisions be removed. If anyone should think that this opinion, that the bishop and the presbyter are one, and that the one designation refers to his age and the other to his office, it is our own and not that of the scriptures. Let him read again the words of the apostle when he speaks to the Philippians. Philippi is one city of Macedonia, and certainly in a single city there could not have been a number of bishops, as they are called. But because at that time the same persons were called bishops and presbyters, he speaks on that account without distinction about bishops as he does about priests. On that account, these things are so, as we demonstrated that among the ancients, presbyters and bishops were the same, but gradually, 
in order that the emerging shoots of dissension might be plucked out, the whole responsibility was transferred to a single person. Therefore, as the presbyters know that they are subject to the one who has been placed over them by an ecclesiastical custom, so the bishops should know that they are greater than presbyters more through custom than through the verity of an ordinance of the Lord, and that they all ought to rule the church in common. End quote. Among the ancients, bishops and priests were the same, St. Jerome says in his letter 69 to Oceanus 3. 15. The survival of the tradition of the synonymity of presbyter and bishop. A relic of the old tradition emerges as late as the turn of the 5th 6th century, when the fourth of the Egyptian canons pseudonymously attributed to St. Hippolytus directs, quote, when a presbyter is ordained, all things concerning him shall be done as concerning a bishop, except taking his seat on the throne. And the bishop's prayer shall be said over him entire, except the name of bishop. The bishop is in all respects the equivalent of the presbyter, except in regard to the throne and ordination, because he was not given authority to ordain. End quote. St. Isidore of Seville, 560-636, in chapter 7, De Presbyteris, of his De Ecclesiasticis Officis, sees the authority to ordain and consecrate reserved to the bishops to prevent, quote, a challenge to the discipline of the church by many to destroy its harmony and general scandals, end quote. And he sees the New Testament addressing bishops under the designation presbyters and comprehending presbyters under the name of bishop. Emilarius of Metz, 780 to 851, in chapter 13, De Presbyteris, of his second book of his De Ecclesiasticis Officis, commits himself to the view of St. Ambrose in his treatise on the letters to St. Timothy, that in ancient times presbyters were called both bishops and presbyters, and to the now familiar view of St. Jerome as expressed in his commentary on Titus and in his letter 146.85 to Evangelus. The fourth part of the 11th slash 12th century Florilegium on the Ecclesiastical Grades in Manuscript, CLM 19414, of the Bayer Staatsbibliothek in Munich, recently edited by Roger E. Reynolds, goes back to a 9th century model, the Collectio Duorum Liberorum. This document combines and adapts De Septum Ordinibus of Pseudo-Jerome, 5th century, and De Ecclesiasticis Officis of St. Isidore. The section on the presbyter rehearses the tradition of its sources on the synonymity of presbyter and bishop in the New Testament. It cites the evidence of the pastorals and goes on, quote, Thus you understand that the sum total of the priesthood is settled in the presbyters. Thus, moreover, presbyters are called priests, a word put together out of a Greek and Latin noun, because they give the holy thing just as the bishop does, end quote. According to Ludwig Ott, even John's nun Scotus, 1264-308, allowed a certain probability to St. Jerome's view. The view of the divine origin of the episcopate was extensively argued at Trent, and that council did not undertake to define the preeminence of bishop of presbyters with reference to the power of jurisdiction and the power of consecration in terms of either divine or human ecclesiastical law. 16. Pre-Reformation Ordinations by Presbyters the earliest description of an ordination that has survived from the early church is in the apostolic tradition ascribed to St. Hippolytus of Rome, died 235. By this time, the monarchical episcopate had been introduced in the church of the city of Rome. In the era prior to the introduction of the monarchical episcopate, ordination would have been imparted by members of the local college of presbyter bishops. Rome, prior to the middle of the 2nd century, would have been a case in point. In the 2nd century, it appears that the local college of presbyters instituted the bishop at Alexandria and Lyons. Canon 13 of the Council of Ancyra, 314, approved by St. Leo IV, bishop of Rome from 847 to 855, provided that neither corepiscopoi nor city presbyters may ordain presbyters or deacons outside their own parochia, unless the bishop has granted permission in the form of a letter for them to do so. According to Blessed John Cassian, 360-435, the Egyptian presbyter abbot, Paphnutius, apparently ordained his successor, Daniel, to both the diaconate and the presbyterate. Even prior to their respective consecrations as bishops, 
Saints Willahad 730 to 789 and Leuser 774 to 809 were administering ordination to the presbyterate in their missionary districts. In his Vita Sancti Villahadi 5, St. Ansgar writes, quote, In the year of the Lord's incarnation, 781, and in the fourteenth year of the reign of the noted Prince Charles, the servant of God, Willahad, began to build churches throughout Wigmodia, a district of Lower Saxony, and to ordain presbyters over them who would freely confer on the peoples of the area, the counsels of salvation and the grace of baptism. End quote. St. Willahod was not consecrated as bishop until 787. Altfried died 849, second bishop of Mimikernofford, Munster in Westphalen, and the successor of his founder, St. Leuger, writes in his Vita Sancti Leuger, 19, quote, He baptized one Landric, the son of a certain prince of Helgoland, and ordained him a presbyter after he had instructed him in the scriptures, end quote. Section 20 of the same biography states that St. Leuger, quote, in his accustomed fashion, with all longing and concern, strove to do good to the rude peoples among the Saxons, by teaching them, and after the thorn bushes of idolatry had been rooted out, to sow the word of God diligently in place after place, to build churches, and to ordain presbyters, whom he had educated to be co-workers with him in proclaiming the word of God in each of these places. End quote. During this period, St. Leuger declined episcopal rank humbly, pontificalum gradum humiliter, and tried to persuade disciples of his to receive episcopal orders in his stead. He yielded only later to the arguments of Bishop Hildebald of Cologne and allowed himself to be consecrated. Following the lead of Hugo of Pisa, Uguccio died 1210, many medieval canonists took the position that a simple presbyter was competent to ordain to the presbyterate if the Pope empowered him to do so. Concretely, the bull Sacri Religionis of Boniface IX, dated February 1, 1400, provides, quote, We grant to the same abbot of the monastery of Saints Peter and Paul, the apostles, and of Saint Oseth, the Virgin and Martyr, of the Order of Canons Regular of Saint Augustine and Essex in the Diocese of London, and to the abbots of the same monastery who are his successors for the time being in perpetuity, to have the power freely and licitly to confer on all professed canons, present and future, all minor orders, as well as subdiaconate, the diaconate, and the presbyterate, at the times established by the law, and that the said canons promoted in this way by the said abbots are able to serve freely and licitly in the orders so received, notwithstanding any conflicting constitutions, apostolic and others, whatsoever, put forth to the contrary and reinforced with any degree whatever of firmness, end quote. Because of the objection of Bishop Robert of London, who had the right of patronage in the monastery named, the same pope on February 6, 1403, in the bull Apostolicae Sedis, withdrew the permission granted in Sacrae Religionis, again specifying that the privilege had authorized the abbots of the monastery to confer orders through the presbyterate. In the bull Gerentes ad Vos, Martin V, on November 16, 1427, conferred on the abbot of the Cistercian monastery at Altzell in Upper Saxony the license and faculty, quote, of conferring on each of the monks of the same monastery and on persons subject to you, the abbot, all holy orders, without in the least requiring a license to do this from the diocesan of the place, notwithstanding any constitutions and ordinances, apostolic and otherwise to the contrary, end quote. On August 29, 1489, Innocent XIII, in the bull Exposit Tuae Devotionis, conferred on Abbot John of Citeaux and on, quote, the four other aforesaid abbots of the Ferte Pontigny, Clairvaux, and Moramont, and to their successors, authority freely and licitly to confer lawfully upon any monks soever of said order, as religious of the aforesaid monasteries whom you shall find qualified therefore, the orders of the subdiaconate and the diaconate. End quote. As conservative a Roman Catholic dogmatician as Ludwig Ott sees this authorization of presbyters to impart orders as posing a question that demands one of two answers. One, either the popes of the 15th century quote, were victims of their erroneous theological opinions of their times, end quote, or two, quote, 
A simple priest is an extraordinary dispenser of the orders of a diaconate and presbyterate, just as he is an extraordinary dispenser of confirmation. In this latter view, the requisite power of consecration is contained in the priestly power of consecration as potestas legata. For the valid exercise of it, a special exercise of the papal power is, by divine or church ordinance, necessary. End quote. With reference to the first answer, at least one Roman Catholic scholar holds that if the popes in question had erred in giving these faculties, the erring pope, quote, in his official capacity as pope, would have imposed material idolatry on those of the faithful who sought the ministry of men ordained in virtue of these bulls, end quote. The final clause of the second answer is, for a Lutheran, of course, not a necessary conclusion. While a Lutheran will not insist that ordinary minister necessarily implies an extraordinary minister in certain circumstances, although this might very well be a legitimate inference, he observes that the bowl of union of the Armenians, ex sultate deo of November 22, 1439, Eugene IV and the Council of Florence, declares with reference to the sacrament of order, quote, the ordinary minister of the sacrament is a bishop. Ordinarius minister hutis sacramenti est episcopus. End quote. Gabriel Vasquez, 1549 to 1604, asserts that the Benedictine presbyter abbots and the Franciscan presbyter missionaries in India had received authority to administer the sacrament of orders, but this statement still lacks documentation. While the historical evidence inclines most Lutherans to deny that the diaconate was originally an integral part of the clerical office, the Roman inclusion of the diaconate among the authentically sacramental grades of the clerical estate is not wholly without significance for the present discussion. If the making of a deacon is part of the single sacrament of order, it would seem to be important that in the case of the diaconate, the minister of the sacrament has had to be a person in episcopal orders. Granted the unity of the sacrament of order that Roman Catholic theology asserts, a Lutheran sees a number of questions arising. For instance, if there is only one sacrament, why should a minister who is competent to administer part of the sacrament not be competent to administer the whole sacrament? Concretely, if a priest is competent to ordain to the diaconate, why is he not intrinsically competent to ordain to the presbyterate? If the Episcopal order is competent to co-opt additional members of the order, and if in emergencies laymen can baptism by co-opt, as it were, additional members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, why cannot the presbyterate function similarly, at least in the case of necessity? Again, if a presbyter is competent to administer one properly Episcopal function, namely confirmation, why is he not competent to administer another properly Episcopal function, namely ordination? If it be argued that to concede the validity of presbyteral ordinations to the presbyterate is depriving the bishop of a privilege that is exclusively his, a possible answer is that the alienation of exclusive privilege is not something unique in the experience of the Episcopal order. Once the monarchical bishop had established his preeminent authority, he was for a long time normally the only person that administered baptism, a privilege that he ultimately came to share with the presbyters. Until the 5th century, it was his exclusive prerogative to preach during the Sunday Eucharist. This prerogative, too, he had to share with the presbyters. Until the 10th century, he alone administered absolution to the penitents who were undergoing public discipline. Thereafter, this became a competence of the presbyters as well. The once exclusively Episcopal privilege of administering chrismation was widely delegated to presbyters in the Eastern Church at an early date. In more recent times, the administration of the parallel Western ceremony of confirmation has ceased to be the exclusive province of the bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. The Lutheran Church does not equate any ecclesial community, its own, the Roman Catholic, SA3, 12, 1, or any other large or small, with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It respects the right of the Roman Catholic Church to determine the canonical licitness of the ordinations performed within that communion and does not seek to impose Lutheran standards of canonical licitness upon the Roman Catholic community. By the same token, it reserves to itself the right to establish by its own standards of canonical licitness in the case of ordinations on those points where the divine law, used divinum, makes no prescriptions, and to reject those of other denominations as binding in matters that cannot be established as being of divine right. <laughs>